Things are happening um, just behind me. I just want to share what's happening in the life of the church. And uh, uh, do you know that guy? That's Nathan Delorenzis. That's actually the INC annual report. And he made it on the annual report. I don't know where he's been for the last three or four weeks. I haven't seen him. But he's on. <laughs> we love you, Nath. I know he's got uh, his daughter cuddled up. He won't let her go. But um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I, INC annual report so he made it on there on the inside cover and then we also made it on the church planting uh, page and that's pastor nick and kim there spotlight on church planting come on so uh we made it in the uh, inc annual report and uh, it speaks very good i didn't even realize some of this stuff you guys you guys are amazing is that all true I have, of course it is, amazing. And uh, it just shares the journey of what's happening there in um, uh, Melton. It's so good and we, we just love that. So that's what's happening over there. Get along to Melton if you haven't been there. Um, it's really a great venue. Uh, this is now what happened uh, 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 yesterday. Uh, just a bit of an update. So that's our pastor, our senior pastor in uh, the Philippines. Uh, we have two churches there, and he hired that basketball court, and they had over 55 children come, young people come, and uh, if you can flick through the next one, um, the next one, and over 23 people, young people received the Lord. So he said there's something happening in our young people and the grow kids over there, they have to, they're moving it to Saturdays because Sundays there's too many and we yet haven't finished the building so we can't fit. So he does um, grow kids on a Saturday and then he does church uh, on, a, on a Sunday. But we're, once we finish the building, and I think we've got a picture of the building, have we? We don't. Can we get it up? I thought we, we, I want to show you the building where it's at, the progression of it, um, and it'll get there in a moment. So um, the interesting thing about that uh, as well, um, there it is, great, awesome. So you would have seen this part, uh, this building that has been finished. So that building runs long ways, if I can use that, and that's uh, around about 15 metres by 10 metres wide. And uh, behind that, we've now been given some land, some space, where we're actually going to cover and we're going to build the kitchen out there. We we're going to build the kitchen inside the building uh, because now we're running church this way, okay? So it, it's made more room, so we're running church this way. And then upstairs is our grow kids, where our grow kids will be, and also our youth as well. Um, there's going to be toilets upstairs as well, which again is, is an amazing thing for, for the Philippines. So uh, continue praying for that. Uh, I'll be going over there on the 5th of October. Um, and we're just believing that uh, we'll have the uh, resources to, to finish that off. But uh, continue praying. God's doing amazing things over there. And uh, especially amongst the young people. And also, again, as I mentioned, and I'll just remind us that that is not only a house what I call the house of God, that God's using on a Sunday, but it's during the week. We're getting people coming in there, using it to study. Uh, some people are using it even for shelter uh, during the, the week. So again, some of the things that are happening at Centerpoint Church that you're a part of, that you've been praying for, uh, giving to, and we just want to give uh, God a big um, praise clap. And again, clap yourself as well. Come on. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for getting that uh, up so quickly, guys, at the back there. So good. Um, today, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the amazing grace of God and the realization that, you know, John Newton came to. And I feel like unless we come to that realization, or if you want to call it revelation, uh, you're not going to know yourself in the light of how God sees you. And if you don't see God, how he sees you, then you won't really understand your need of Jesus. He will become an appendage, an addition to your life rather than your life. See, for John Newton, it became his life. 
For John Newton, Jesus was all and in all. And you heard the story of where he come from. And I feel like that we, when we come to the understanding of who we are in the light of who God is, then we can say hand on heart and we realize our ever-present need of Jesus. Here's the thing, the other side of that. When we begin our journey with Jesus, as we go down life's journey with Jesus, sometimes what happens is that we begin to pick up access baggage. We, we, in our journey, we pick up this unnecessary baggage that weighs us down and, and it weighs on our life. And it restricts us from growing or moving forward. And I don't know about you, but maybe in your life, because certainly it has happened to me from time to time, I just get stuck. I, I, I get restricted. I become obstructed. And the reality is, is when I take a step back in view of what God wants for me, there's been a weight that I've been carrying. There's been some baggage I've picked up along the way. And therefore, I've stopped moving forward. And I've then had a different view of the kingdom for that time because of a restriction. You know, in certain venues around the world, you pay cheaper for certain seats because there's a restricted view. I remember at the MCG when I went there, I got these really good tickets, although I thought they were. They were cheap as, and guess what? I can only see three quarters of the game. The other quarter was, was uh, hidden because of the grandstand. So they were cheap seats. They were restricted viewing. And I feel like sometimes as Christians, we can carry, we can pick up in life's journey some access baggage that we don't realize, but yet we require to be released or offloaded because that access is restricting us. You know, St. Paul puts us this way, put it this way, and obviously there's a, here's a guy that, you know what, we want to listen to. He knew about this restriction and obstruction. He says this in Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd, of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially, everybody say especially, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured for sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but the fact of the matter remains that each of us at times may carry a sin that especially trips us up. And this morning, as I'm speaking, in fact, right now, maybe can we just close our eyes right now? Because this is so, so important, hey? Yeah. Because, and I'm going to explain a little bit what sin is in light of what he's talking about here today. But Father God, right now, I pray that, Lord, those of us that might be in, right now in that season of obstruction, in that season of restriction, Lord, that we might just come to you now, Holy Spirit. And Lord, I know you're going to put a light on what that is. I know that you're going to show us right now. You're going to be speaking to us during this message. God, we, we just don't want it to be a sermon. Lord, we want your words to be life and life-giving and, Lord, transforming us into the person and persons that you have planned for us. So, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Bring to the light that which easily trips us up, that we might, Lord, strip that off so that we can keep our eyes on you and run the race. Thank you so much. So I'm believing that during this message, some of you are going to get a light on that, whatever that is. And my prayer is, is that you don't walk out of here without stripping off. Um, 
you know what, new seasons, we talk about it, they're about change, but not necessarily about changing location. The reality is, is when it comes to God, more times often than not, change is about space. It's about making more room. See, God has so much for us, but sometimes we uh, fill up that space with baggage that restricts the room that he wants to make so that he can give you what he's already set for you. Does that make sense? So the whole spirit of why Paul is saying what he's saying is he's saying, hey, we want you, God wants you to strip off that baggage that we pick up during our journey. He wants us to strip that off so that we can run a race and we can run it with endurance so that we can make room, space in our life for what God wants for you and I. Like a good dad, like a good mum, we want things for our children. But sometimes our children are filling their time, they're filling their energy, their mind with other things and therefore they can't receive, they won't receive, they shun what mum and dad wants to give them. And the same is with our spiritual lives. And this morning, my prayer is that we would strip those things off. Why? Because God wants to give you what He's already set for you. If you don't change your life patterns according to your life revelations, then your God perspective will be limited. And it will only be, you'll only know God from your familiar framework. You know, when we come to the knowledge of God, we start a framework. But yet, if we don't build on that through revelation that God gives us, the truth that you hear, the truth that you read, that God's speaking into your heart via the Holy Spirit, if we don't apply that, then what happens is is that we'll remain limited in our familiar framework and we'll wonder why. Why isn't it happening? The reality is, is that we're not moving or we're not removing baggage and stripping off so that God says, hey, I've given you this revelation, this truth. You need to apply that. It's not just to be read, but it's for you to feed on and for you to meditate on and for you to live out. Never allow, and I want to encourage you, never allow circumstances to hinder vision. Don't do it. And you say, well, how don't we? It's very, very simple, but yet it's seemingly hard to do. When we trust Jesus, when we trust Jesus, He provides us the strength to move through the circumstance. He gives us the strength to move through, to to be in that circumstance and not allow the circumstance to hinder us, but yet understanding that, hey, I'm trusting Jesus. So if I'm trusting Jesus, this circumstance is here for a purpose and a reason. And you know what? I'm trusting Him to move through it. The reality is that in Christianity, doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. How many times has doubt stopped you from moving forward? Because maybe you failed once. Oh, maybe you failed twice. Maybe you failed even three times. But now you are doubting, so therefore you stop. And therefore you are beginning to breed ground of regret. Do you know doubt breeds regret? Then you'll say, oh, if only, if only only I did that, only I did that. I should have done this and I should have done that. But the reality is, is that we don't do that because fear of failure. But I look at Paul, how many times did he fail? Look at Peter, how many times did he fail? Mate, he even cursed God. He was called, get behind me, Satan. Do you think he would have had some doubts of moving forward? But yet this man was given the keys to the kingdom. This man stood up and preached and thousands came to Jesus. This man set up the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Had he just remained in his doubt, had had he not trusted Jesus, I feel like it would have been a different story. See, trust is the highest form of faith. You've often heard me say that. Trust is the graduation school for following God-given plans and promises. You can't follow the promises of God, the plans of God, no matter how, how nice they are, if you don't trust Him and start moving towards those plans and promises for you. You've got to move towards them before you have them. You have them in the Spirit. You have them because of the truth that God says you have them, but now you've got to grow in them. You've got to to receive them. 
And part of receiving them is trusting Him and moving towards them. Faith is the way through when there seems no way out. Come on. Some of us just, even to maybe this week, you think, what? there's no way out of this situation. No, faith is, meaning trusting Jesus. It's the way out. It sounds, all this sounds intangible. Sounds gobbledygook. It sounds like, oh, yeah, this is amazing talk, but what's the reality of it? Here's the thing. There's always a thing. There's always a reality where this intangible becomes tangible. God cannot shape what we withhold from his hands. God cannot shape that thing that you're holding back. You can say, I'm trusting you, Jesus, but if you're not giving it to him, because that's what trust does, gives. If you're not giving it to him, well, then he can't shape it. He can't make it. He can't change it because he wants to, but we withhold. When you allow God to get a hold of your life, the things that you can't change naturally, here's the thing, the things that we can't change naturally, when surrendered to him, you know what? He changes supernaturally. But yet, when we withhold, we're saying, maybe not with our words, but we're saying, I, I don't trust you with this. I trust myself. Man, trusting yourself? Do you know what the Bible says about our heart? It's what? It's deceitfully. It, it, it's filled with deceit. It tricks us. Our emotions trick us. Man, has it tricked me? But yet, when we surrender that thing that I want to get changed naturally, that I want to have control over, trust says, no, I'll give it to you. And trust says, now I'll wait on you. And let me see what you do. I see that in the story of the boy with the loaves and fishes. Had he withheld that bread and fish, no one would have got fed. He withheld it. It wouldn't have got fed. But because he was willingly, he, he willed to surrender to Jesus, only fish and loaves, guess what? Other people were fed. And I want to say this. There are some things in our lives that we're withholding. And actually, because we're withholding them, other people aren't finding Christ. And this is not like a, I'm putting a burden on us. It's the reality. Who are these people out there going to hear Jesus from if it's not from us? Who are they going to see a test? Who are they going to hear a testimony from if it's not us? And and if it's not us, it's because you know what we're holding back. We're, we're sitting in our homes. Why are we sitting in our homes? Because we feel guilty. Because we've failed. We tried that. Oh, I've got no power. All of that kind of stuff. Surrender it. Surrender it to Jesus. He did not leave you here so that you would sit at home in self-pity. Sit at home in a place where you think you have nothing to offer. You have Jesus to offer. Your life is an offering. But we've got to offer it back to Him. What about the woman who was bent over 12 years, who had a, a, a massive issue of blood for 12 years, long time. Some of us have got long time stuff that we've been holding on to. She took a a, a massive risk, touching a man of God, being unclean. That is stoning, guys, according to the law. But she chose to put that aside and said, I'm going to trust Jesus. He, if he's the guy with healing in his wings, because that's what it was in his tassels, he, she touched the tassel, the hem of his garment. She t- and he said, Somebody touched me. Power's left me. Do you know Jesus is waiting for you to touch him? Yeah. Jesus is waiting you to hand over. He's just waiting. There's power. There's grace. There's mercy. There's forgiveness. He is full of it. Yeah. And in a good way, in a God way. Not like we say that about someone else. Hey, you're full of it. <laughs> We're talking about he's full of the goodness of God. He's the carrier through the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, 12 years, long time. Some of us have got long time baggage. We've got long time stuff. So how do we do this? Well, St. Paul tells us it's time for us to strip off. Imagine if he stopped there. You need to strip off. It'd be a sore sight, wouldn't it? If I started stripping off here, Peter, would you be running back to Geelong? You'd forget about your car. What's he asking us to strip off? It's stripping off the weight that slows us down. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I've even heard in the natural. I've spoken, I've said this myself. You know what? I've got to get rid of this weight because it's slowing me down. It's slowing me down. I heard people talk about, oh, this, weight, this excess weight I'm carrying, slowing me down. Um, you know, I'm not as sharp anymore. I'm tired. I'm lethargic. There's weight in the natural that slows us down. Same in the spirit. We pick up stuff that slows us down. And the writer to Hebrews is talking about a retardant weight, a, a, a weight of heaviness. It might be of heart. It might be of soul. It might be of spirit. It's something we've picked up that weighs heavy on us. It's not light. You know, Christianity is meant to be fun. And I'm not talking about happy clappy, but it's enjoyable. It's challenging. It's adventurous. It's not this. That's burden. And Jesus says, if you're walking around like this in the Spirit, come to me, all of you are heavy laden. He, he's got the answer. He doesn't want you to walk around like this in the Spirit. He, you're a son. You're a daughter. He wants you to be freed of that. And he's saying that he wants us to strip off what's not light, what is not heavenly, but heavy. He wants us to live heavenly, not heavy so what is the sin that so easily trips us up i just want to focus a little bit about that because saint paul is not talking about the sin as in the beginning what happened with adam sin nature because jesus christ came to die for that but he's talking about sin in the form of trespass he's talking about sin which means to fall short of the mark when, you know, when you, we were having it last week, uh, when it was a Father's Day, and they were shooting that arrow, those fake arrows, and it, they were falling short. It didn't make its mark. And that's what sin is in our life. It causes us, the baggage, the access, the weight, causes us from falling short of the mark that God has for us. Not perfection. It's of what God has planned for us. God's got so many plans for us. But we, the baggage that we carry, he's saying strip off because we know that when we have excess baggage and we go on a plane, it costs money. It costs access, costs, baggage costs. It's going to cost you, John. It's going to cost you and you're going to fall short of what I have for you. And I feel like this morning God's calling us to strip it off. So what is it? What's that thing that easily gets you? See, when we do live with that access, this is what happens. It means that we live a beneath life. We live a beneath life. You know, Jesus said in his uh, Gospels to the Pharisees, you think you live the above life because you walk on the, the high road and all of the common people walk on the dust. You think you are high because you walk on the high road, but actually you're from beneath. Jesus walked on the dusty roads of Jerusalem and he said, I am from above. So is it a, a place that he's talking about? No, he's talking about a, an attitude that will lift your altitude into the heavens to understand that when we carry baggage that weighs us down and we live this beneath life we don't see the heavenly life our attitudes might change it, it's when we fall short of the direction and destiny that God has for us that he's initially uh, uh, created for us to enjoy and live in these are some of the things that could be I'm just saying it could be could be that mindset could even be an attitude that you've now picked up. It could even be a thought process of religion. Here's the thing. What, what does something like that say? Oh, but I know better. It's okay. I know better. But do you? Because that's got a hold of you now. That's weighing you down now. You think you know better. You think you're in control. Or maybe it's an indulgence or a habit which you're saying, oh, it's under control. How many times have I heard people indulge in things or they, they, they've got a, a habit that they say, it's okay, Pastor John, it's under control. How can you even think that an indulgence that's not godly or a habit is 
under control. No, yeah, that's right. You're under the control of it. Absolutely. And it's robbing you and you're falling short of the mark of what God wants for you in your life. And this morning, I feel like some of us, we're going to surrender. We're going to strip off this stuff. Many say losing weight is all in the mind. I say, if that's the case, my stomach never got that email. (laughs) I wish it was all in the mind. The reality is, it's not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have Jenny Craig programs, Tony Ferguson weight loss, body trim, light and easy, the paleo diet, the no carbs diet, the protein diet. And right now, I'm on a diet of coffee and lemon. And it's working, by the way. It's working. Coffee and lemon. And I'm going to add some garlic and parsley because I know my Lebanese friend, Pastor Rob, says that's even better. (laughs) But why do we have these weight loss programs if it's only in the mind? The reality is, is you know what, we've picked up some bad habits when it comes to eating. You know, gnocchi at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, it is beautiful. But it creates baggage, doesn't it? So, you know, you want to change your body, you've got to change your eating habits. You've got to remove some stuff. Someone said to me, the best way to lose weight is to keep your mouth shut and close your eyes to food. Well, yeah, that would mean I'd be dead. Because only then would my eyes be shut and my mouth be shut when you're dead. So that's not going to work. But when it comes to the kingdom, according to St. Paul, uh, these aren't my words, so speak to him. According to St. Paul, stripping weight off in the kingdom is totally opposite to shutting your mouth and your eyes. In fact, it's keeping your mouth open, praising him, worshiping him. It's keeping your eyes open to Jesus, seeking him first in our lives. Totally opposite, totally different. Shutting our mouth, shutting our eyes to food, when it comes to that weight but when it comes to a weight that we've picked up it's about praising him god you know what i worship you man i'm coming to you because i got weight and i'm going to follow you i'm going to trust in you for some of us today it's time to strip off that weight that so easily trips us up Easily, and I'm saying easily, it trips us up. Why? So we have the endurance. Paul talks about an endurance. We have an endurance to commit to the maintenance program that he's already set up. We don't have to go looking for it, he's set up. He's saying, If you come to me, I've got the maintenance program. It's called relationship. My Holy Spirit will tell you, and guess what? we'll come back into an alignment and we'll continue to look to Jesus. And I feel like some of us need to stop waiting, but we need to start to strip off and say, here it is. Or we need to stop and wait. Some of you are waiting for someone else to do it for you. It ain't going to happen. You know, you can, you can go uh, to a trainer and he's got all of the, the, the keys to to weight loss or whatever but then if you do that in front of him and you go home and go to the pantry let me tell you it's not going to work I've tried it it's not going to work for that half an hour doing what he's telling you to do and then you go home and live a, a, a different lifestyle when we're talking about portions we're talking about when to eat yes sir no sir three bags full sir we go home and then we hit the pantry and it's our own way and I feel like some of us do that when it comes to the things of God we get the revelation on it but then we don't have endurance why because we haven't stripped off you know um, I can't remember when it was but it was I think while while COVID was on um, I loaned my car to my, my son-in-law and uh when I hopped in it, well, I'm blaming him anyway. It's probably me. When I hopped in it, you know, my car was like pulling to one side. It was like, you know, I needed every kind of ounce of force to um, hold it straight. And the fact of the matter is, you know, you can hit the gutter or curb with your car and you might not break anything. There might not be anything visibly broken. But what you will find 
is that it will alter the way it drives. It will alter the way it drives. Your alignment will be out. The car's tires will wear. Any mechanics here? The car's tires will eventually wear and that steel stuff will start coming out. And like I said, you might have to apply brute force because that's what I needed to do. And it was probably me that hit the curb, I don't know. But I had to apply brute force to keep this thing going straight. And even when I would pull up, the wheels would start to wobble and the whole shaking up the steering wheel and you'd be shaking the steering wheel. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. But that's only because my car was out of alignment. I'd hit a curb. And you know what? Sometimes as Christians, we hit a curb. We, we pick up baggage and it weighs us down to one side and you know we're trying to keep this thing on there. We're doing it ourselves. I can do it. Look at me. But God doesn't want you doing that. He wants to spend your energy on loving someone else. Not trying to keep your, your life on track because he's saying, come to me and I'll keep your life on track. But we're trying to keep our life on track. In Luke 15, the prodigal son's life altered. Why? It was out of alignment. Why? Because he stopped looking to his father as the provider. He said, mate, I'm on my own now. I'm a big boy now. Thank you. I'll have my inheritance right now. You don't need to provide for me anymore. I'm going on my own. And we know what happens. Effectively, he veered off the favor freeway. The favor freeway being grace. He veered off the favor freeway. And do you know what he hit? He hit a curb of criticism. He became a critic. And that was even before he left the palace. That happened in his heart first. And then when he left, all that happened was the manifestation of what was happening in his heart and in his life. Resulting in an I know better attitude. How many of us know better than God? Please don't put your hand up. But how many of us think we do by our actions? Maybe there's a few of us. I certainly would have to put my hand up in some times in my life that I thought I knew better. But what had happened, I'd hit a curb and I'd become critical because I stopped looking to Him as my provider. I started to take life on as my own, resulting in an I know better attitude, which is the catalyst for a season of destruction, or as the Bible says it, for riotous living or sinful living, falling short of the mark. So what do we do? I might be in that place today. Can I give you three things? Can I give you three things to align ourselves again? The first thing is that we've got to understand that we must come to ourselves. We've got to, we've got to come to ourselves. We've got to have a a, a reality check. Boy, do they hurt. Boy, are they scary. A reality check. And especially when someone that you look to actually tells you that's even worse. When they say, really, John, this is who you are. Wow. Reality check. Being real. I know that that's a, a term and a cliche nowadays, but it's being authentic to who you are. And that's okay. But we need to be there. We need to come to that understanding. We need to come to that, that place. See, the truth still sets you free. It's not just we read the truth, shall shed. It still sets you free. Masks and facades keep us trapped in isolated environments, robbing us, robbing us from the freedom to travel on that favor freeway for our lives. Number two, so one is understanding that we must come to ourselves. Number two, you know what? Humility is comfortable with honesty. They go hand in hand. It's not like, oh, you know what? See, if you're proud, then honesty is something that will come against pride. But when you're humble, you've got to have a spirit of humility let me tell you, honesty is able to be spoken about 
reality, authenticity becomes now an opportunity for God to come and invade that and says, mate, we've got something to work with. Not like, oh, look, you're too bad for me. See, that's religion. But he says, honesty. I, I resist the proud, but I give grace and I lift the humble. Our lives will rise when we acknowledge where we're at and take responsibility for that situation. We're going to take responsibility. And you know what? The prodigal took responsibility. He stood up. He rose from that pig pen. He rose from that pig pen. We're going to stop blaming Satan's ploy. We're going to stop using it and, and, and blaming him. He just wants to contain you. He wants to keep you in the pigeon pen. But you know what? What God has deposited in you is enough strength for you to stand up. We can't expect to come up with solutions to our now problems by using the same kind of thinking that created them. What does the Bible say? Happened to the prodigal son? He came to himself. I would like to say that revelation came to him because there was deposit. And let me tell you, in each and every one of us, God has deposited himself. He resides there. The Father resides there. And so does the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that. If we're born again of the Spirit of God, they have made their home in us. So what, what's, what happens is we've just got to listen to the revelation. We've got to strip off anything that's stopping that revelation from coming through. Some of us here maybe haven't heard God for a long time. I'm telling you, it's time to strip off. It's time to take off that weight. We've got to determine our location. Sure. If it's in the pig pen, it's in the pig pen. There was nothing, nowhere worse that this kid could be. In a pig pen with pigs as a Jew, as, a royal, as royalty. He was royalty in a pig pen eating the food and actually the refuse waste of the pigs. How low can you get? How low can you get? But guess what? He came to himself. He stood up. He got up. He went to God or his father in this, in this story. And he humbled himself and said, I'm ready to come back. And I love this story because what happens is, is that the father didn't wait for him in the space of his palace. He came out to him. God has the right people with the right purposes in the right places to help you. But here's the thing. We need to humble ourselves. And maybe some of us need to do that today. And reach out to those that God has placed in your life because they once carried the weight that you did. And they know the pain. They know the suffering of it. And they know what it takes for it to be stripped off. And they'll get alongside and encourage you. And I want to encourage you to do that. Remember this. The quality of life is determined by the quality of your relationship. Your quality of life today is determined by the quality of your relationships. See, when this guy was in the pig pen, what led him to the pig pen? A type of relationship with people. But then what brought him back to the kingdom? A connection with the Father. And some of us are doing life with pig pen people. Now, please hear my heart. I do life with pig pen people because I want to win them. But if I know that I've got some baggage that's skewing the way I look at things, I can easily get drawn into that pig pen life. And some of us have been in the name of going and saving them. We've found ourselves lost in there, like the prodigal. So I'm saying, we need some kingdom connections. Come on, you find them at Connect Group. You find them in team. You find them by inviting someone out for lunch on a Sunday. You find them about, you know, calling someone up and having a coffee with them during the week. Kingdom connection. Relationships. You want your situations to change? Maybe find some quality relationships in life. Now, number three, and we'll finish with this. Embrace God's acceptance. We've got to take it. Come on. He's there to give it to us. And this is sometimes the hardest thing to do, and that is to forgive yourself. It's the hardest thing to do because of pride, 
because of maybe, oh, how can they accept me again? But it's the hardest thing to do. But let me tell you, we've got to allow ourselves to uh, allow God to give us all that He has for us and what's waiting for us. Just some of the things that the Father did who represents the Father to us. He's got unconditional love. He ran out and kissed this kid, knocked him down with his kisses, smashed him. He slapped some kisses on this kid. Nothing else was said, slapping kisses on him. Put a ring on him, they said. He said, what does that represent? Unbroken relationship, commitment. We might break relationship, but he doesn't. He wants to put a ring on us because he doesn't want the relationship broken. It's eternal. This relationship's eternal. Doesn't matter what situation you're in. Doesn't matter if you picked up some baggage. He's saying, hey, I'm committed to you. As soon as you strip that off, guess what? You're going to make more room for me. And that's where I want to be. Because when we pick up baggage, we squeeze him out. We squeeze him out. There's no place for him. And he's saying, I want to get back in there. Sandals. He was given sandals because he came, he's lost everything. What are sta- sandals? They're the steps that are ordered by the Lord. They're the shoes that are going to take you. They're the, the sandals that are going to take us and they're going to help us walk according to where He has set for us. It's our GPS. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's given us shoes to put on that we can walk in the way that He would have us walk, in the terrain that's coming our way. The robe, the robe of righteousness. What does that do? Covers all our imperfections. I love it. You know this story, not sure if I've mentioned it here, but if you actually know the culture of Judaism and uh, especially the way that this king, this palace was set up, what it is is there's the palace and then outside the palace gates, there is another section where all the workers are tending the field. So there's the palace that's surrounded by the field and all the workers are there. Then there's the outer gates, Do you know what the father did? He ran. Well, he ran past the workers and he received his son outside the gates because he wanted him to enter as royalty. He covered him with that robe. See, God doesn't want to shame you. Satan wants to shame you. But the Father wants to run through even the workers of the field and meet you outside those gates and clothe you. That's where he put the ring on. That's where he put the sandals on. That's where he put the robe on. And then guess what? He said, go before me and prepare the fatted calf because my son who was lost is now found. Can we stand up? How good is our God? He's amazing. And when we see ourselves in the light of how he sees us, can I tell you, your life is going to be different. But we're going to strip off some of us. Because we're not seeing this because we've got no room to see it. We're so taken up with all the baggage that we've collected. And some of you have been collecting it for 15, 20, 30 years maybe. And you've never put it off. Well, can I say today, can you, if the Holy Spirit has put a light on that, will you strip off? Will you strip off to Him? Because here's the thing. We've got to respond. There needs to be a response. And what's your response today? The prodigal son needed to respond. He came to himself. There was a light revelation that it shone on him and he needed to respond. And that's all we need to do. Because I'll tell you what happens. When we respond, God reinstates. All we need to do is respond and come to him and he reinstates. Do you know what he also does? He realigns us. So He reinstates us. He realigns us. We're all good. We're in fellowship. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Don't you leave me or forsake me. 
So He reinstates us. He realigns us. And then He says, He relaunches us. Go, be my son, be my daughter. You're forgiven. Come on, you're empowered. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But we've got to strip off. We've got to come to ourselves, to that understanding. So this morning, Father God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that John Newton, it took him six years to understand. But Lord, it's a journey. But Lord, he came to an understanding of your love, of your mercy, of your grace, your unconditional love. And Lord, because he was willing to take off all that other baggage, Lord, we have a song for the ages that describes so well your amazing grace. And Father, today, I know that there are people here in this building right now that you want and you're calling them to remove some baggage. That, that sin that is easily tripping them up, God. I know you're calling them to do that. And this morning, Lord, they're going to surrender to you. And Lord, then they're going to enjoy. They're going to see what kingdom is all about. They're going to see what kingdom is all about. And maybe today, that's you. Can I ask you to get out of your seat? Can I ask you to come to him this morning? I would like to pray for you, if that's okay. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. You don't have to say what that is. That's between you and God. That thing that's easily besetting you. That thing that's you know is restricting you. It's an obstruction. 